Hi, everyone. Welcome to a Whiskey Advocate Tasting. My name is Keith Goldston. I am the Master Sommelier for Landry's Incorporated. And when I'm not doing wine, I like to drink lots of whiskey. Um, it's a sad truth. Um, no, it's not sad. Nothing sad about it at all. Whiskey is absolutely delicious. And for a lot of us who have spent years and years in the restaurant industry, it is the only way you can survive years and years in the restaurant industry. Um, also joining me and uh, expert here at Landry's, I have Scott Tarwater. Scott, what is your official title? Because I just like to think of you as like kind of like the wine whisperer, the spirits whisperer, which is kind of fun. But, yeah, and you know yeah. what? Both of those are very applicable to me. But uh, I'm a corporate beverage director for Landry's and uh, a handful of ha uh, handle a handful of uh, concepts for our company, and kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit because today is uh, a, is an ideal time to be talking about brown spirits. We're in that right time of year. It's February. We've had chilly, cold weather throughout the entire United States. What is better than sitting back with a nice uh, uh, glass of whiskey uh, to kind of warm up your soul and warm up your your heart so to speak we have at landry's we have about 55 different concepts and just to think about a few uh those of you that have had a chance to go to a mastro's or a chart house or morton steakhouse or the palm steakhouse and one of the things that we really pride ourselves in we have really become experts and 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 understand the importance of whiskey uh, especially american whiskeys in our portfolios we have some of our restaurant concepts have upwards of 60 70 even 100 American whiskeys on hand on any given day at any one of those restaurants uh, that I just mentioned. So it's a big, big part about uh, of what we do, and uh, we're pleased today uh, to be able to talk about uh, kind of a new a newcomer to the scene. Yeah, this is going to be super exciting because I'm going to get a little, you know geek out a little bit like I normally do about wine, but in this case, music. Um, this is a kind of whiskey that burst on the scene called Blackened. And why I'm so excited is the fact that Metallica are partners in this. And it's actually one of the few things where it's not just lending their name. They've actually lended their music to help make it, which we'll dive into in a bit. But it's just such an interesting kind of fun thing for me because I remember years ago, I was working at this fine dining restaurant in San Francisco in the early 90s. And I actually remember the guys coming into the restaurant and dining and drinking great wines, having great spirits. So it's like, they've always appreciated really great things. So to see them kind of dive in behind the scenes to make whiskey for me is really exciting. And, um, you know, when they first came about it, they brought out Dave Pickroll, who is one of the master distillers that, that is no longer with us, unfortunately, but talk about bringing in a legendary icon to help them build this. Yeah, and 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 just wanted to throw in that today's is going to be about blended whiskey with blackened, uh, and we have, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to introduce a special guest. But this blended whiskey phenomena has been going on um, um, since the beginning of distillation, and it's really the art of blending the parts. And what we all feel happens is the sum, the final product, is better than the parts. And I think that that's something that's going to be kind of repeated throughout this lesson plan today. Let's find out who we have is joining us today, Keith. Yeah, we're very lucky to have Rob Dietrich, who is, you know, a superstar in his own right. Um, Rob, how long? Uh, oh, first, welcome to the show. You know, great to have you here. Great to taste with Thanks, you. Sterling. Yeah, great to be here. It's great to uh, great to meet both of you and uh, happy to be here, gents. Yeah, and I think we're going to get started with just the, the, the blackened, blended whiskey. And for me, it's kind of fun because I always look at it a little bit through the wine prism. And I also think of like single vineyard wines versus blending from multiple vineyards. And it's, you know, I, I learned very early in the wine industry that just because it's a single vineyard doesn't mean it's any better. That sometimes, you know, the sum of parts can add up to something a lot better. And when you go about blending whiskey, is that your mentality or, you know, how, well, yeah, how do you make this delicious thing? And it's true, you know, and, and kind of uh, using whiskey terminology, you know, a lot of people are seeking out like a single barrel. They, they want just that one unique single barrel, um, you generally at a cask strength. Um, you know, I think I think having a, a good sessionable whiskey at, a, at about 90 proof, um, you know, makes it a very enjoyable experience. But there's um, that 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 extra experience with a, a higher proof whiskey, like a cask strength um, coming from like a single distillery, um, almost like, you know, like a single malt. That's that's from one distillery. Um, a blend would be whiskeys from a variety of different distilleries. And I think. 
uh, you know, historically in the United States, that blending was always a part of that because you you know not every distillery can make enough whiskey to to really kind of keep the the, the lights on so to speak. So being able to team up with other distilleries, being able to utilize their whiskey stores, and likewise, uh, if they have a bad year where their their crops aren't doing as well and uh, and they they have less whiskey to be able to store, there was always this community, this camaraderie between uh, American distillers. They're they're you know they're already pioneers. They're pioneering. They're dealing with the elements. They're dealing with uh, locusts. They're dealing with all sorts of aspects. So they really needed to rely on each other to be able to uh, keep in business. And so that's where blending really kind of came to the forefront um, as part of the the, the the American pioneering spirit. Uh, so uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask. Speaking of that, working together. Um, how do you know how the actual initial meeting with like Dave and the band came together and who pitched who on the idea? And, you know, what's, the, what's, you know, the radioactive spider, that's the origin story that started all this. Yes, no, that's a, and it's a great story. I think, um, what's, what's really exciting about it. I mean, obviously as soon as, uh, Dave heard, you know, that Metallica wanted to make a whiskey, it was, it was all yeses. You know, he's, he was a huge Metallica fan as am I. And uh, and really where it started that the band has always been uh, very loyal to their fans. They have a very loyal fan base. Their fans are, are just global. Um, you know, the biggest, the largest fan base is in the United States. I think the second is South America. Third is, is Mexico. And then you've got Europe and beyond. It is um, really amazing to see that fan base. And they wanted another way to connect to those fans. Metallica is always finding unique ways to connect with their fans uh, and just like they do with everything in their music production, they throw a thousand percent at it. Everything they do is, you know, they get the the highest quality sound equipment, the highest, you know, the best uh, sound engineers. Everything they do to create music uh, is all passion uh, and they've, they're have masters of their craft. So it was really important for them when they set out to make a whiskey that they sought out a master of, of the craft. And that was Dave Pickerel. Obviously, um, for anyone who's who's been you know following whiskey advocate for years or just the the craft of whiskey scene, Dave Pickerel is is really the Johnny Appleseed and and pioneer of the craft distilling, especially whiskey and and more importantly rye. You know, Dave really embraced that rye uh, aspect, which I'm I'm a huge fan of rye. I I cut my teeth uh, making single malt whiskey in Colorado, uh, and that's what that, that's what I did for 13 years here. And then being able to work into uh, traditional whiskey, you know, using bourbons, using rye, being able to blend them together and create, you know, taking these these very unique and, and, and independent whiskeys that taste great on their own, but blending them together to create something phenomenal. That's uh, that's the artistry, and that's exactly where Dave came in. Um, and you know, I know that uh, you know that that was uh, a. a an incredible meeting. David is such a down to earth uh, and such a knowledgeable individual and so passionate about what, uh, what he, you know, what he did. He could, you know, he was a, a chemical engineer, so he could really look down to the molecular level of whiskey and, and identify what was going on there on a science, you know, from a science point of view, but also on the, on the passion of the history of it. Uh, Dave really honed in on some of those traditional methods and, and then went beyond that with some innovation that, uh, you know, a lot of times when people are so used to um, doing things a certain way and you come in with a new idea, there's always some skepticism, you know, like so we're doing the sonic enhancement. But I think it's just the same kind of skepticism that people uh, who are used to riding horses, uh, they see their first automobile come into town. They're like, wow, I'm never stepping foot in that thing. And of course, now almost everybody has two or three cars in their household. So. Um, it really is um, uh, Im important to embrace that that innovation as a pioneer. How does the uh, uh, the the selection of the barrels? How does that piece of the puzzle happen? What type of group uh, uh, is it? it is it almost like a chemistry type of lab where you guys are wearing white jackets and and uh, graduated cylinders and beakers, so on and so forth? Give us a little insight on that. Uh, well, these days I, I, I do have the graduated cylinders, but uh, it's more, you know, in, uh, in my slippers and a T-shirt uh, instead of the white lab coat and, uh, and after the, the, the distillery. Uh, but the, the blending really, um, it, it, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's following your instincts, really. It's, it's, 
you know, nosing a whiskey, nosing several whiskeys and kind of identifying, okay, I want to start with this one. We're going to use that one as the base. And then, okay, what's going to balance that? What's going to uh, really kind of, uh, um, you know, hold that whiskey into a, a different mode and then adding, you know, the different elements. And, you know, and it's funny how uh, when you're, when you really start blending, you are, you know, you start with a base and if you add a couple of uh, different whiskeys and you taste it and you're like, okay, that's not the direction I was going with, you have to start all over again. You know, you, you already know what your base is, but you can't just dump out the element that you didn't like. You, you're, yeah. There you go. You have to, you know, you have to start back at that base again and you keep building up until you're like, okay, that worked next level. That whiskey worked. Those two whiskeys work great together. That's always going to be my next base. And then you add something to that and it, okay, that doesn't quite work dump those out, but now you already have those two whiskeys that you've already selected as, as your base. Um, so you can, you just keep building and building and it's, it's like, it's like the layers of a whiskey onion, so to speak, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just it's un, unfolding. And, and blooming. Well, that, you know, that sounds fascinating. And, 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 and Keith, I think that was something that I would love to play around with. Do we have a chance to do something like that, Rob? Oh, uh, we do. I, we, um, it was really exciting. You know, I took, uh, we, we, we have several elements for our whiskey. You know, we've got Tennessee bourbon, we've got Kentucky bourbon, Indiana rye, Indiana bourbon. We've also got Canadian rye. Um, we sent you guys uh, just, just three elements of our whiskey. Uh, these are, these are some of the, the whiskeys that make up uh, the, the, the whole of, uh, of blackened. So we got these cute little guys here. Um, so we can get that, get that there. So these are, um, you know, we've got our base uh, Indiana rye, uh, we also have uh, Kentucky bourbon and uh, Tennessee bourbon. Uh, so these are numbered. We'll start with the number one there. Uh, but, you know, generally what I like to do before we be, before we do a blend, I always um, I always have a control. So a control is the the last whiskey, the last finished whiskey that I made uh, will be the control. So this is a finished um, uh, the finished whiskey. Uh, now, of course, this was cask finished in, in black brandy barrels. We don't have uh, that element of brandy with this, but we are uh, for this um, for for this exercise. You know, we're we're really working with just a couple of the elements of the whiskey anyway, just to just to really identify what um, how quickly it can go right or how quickly it can go wrong. You know, so it's a uh, uh, and that's where that delicate balance. So um, so I like to try. I, I like to start with the control, um, just so we have that that elements that flavor profile in our in our mouth um and and before uh before that i always like to nose a little bit so again probably you know utilizing the same tools that you use uh, um in, in the wine industry keeping your lips slightly parted breathing in through your nose and your mouth at the same time uh you're going to be able to pick up uh, those olfactory uh elements and then a uh, nice little sip to acclimate the mouth uh let it roll over the sides of your tongue and then that second sip, you're going to be able to get a lot more of the, the flavor profile. Is, is, I mean, first off, Rob, it's delicious. Um, oh, I'm glad you enjoy it. Uh, but there's that part of me, I'm like, I would hate to get that in a blind tasting because I, it's like you get the bourbon notes, then you get the rye notes, and then all of a sudden, like, the brandy kind of rapey comes in on the finish, and it's just like, that's really kind of cool, and it's all these notes playing with each other. So uh, well, it, it, it definitely has layers without question. It kind of builds up a little intensity. It builds up a little momentum as it's going down. So pretty nifty. That's that, that fine balance. That's the artistry of blending. Um, you know, and I think, you know, again, speaking historically, you know, we were talking about how distilleries relied on each other to, to do, you know, to create these blends to, so that they can continue to, to thrive. Um, but there was a there was a period of time in America where um, it was kind of a free for all and we were unregulated. That was when we were actually so regulated that it became unregulated. You know, prohibition really kind of created uh, and opened up the door for people to just make whatever they wanted. Um, and they're using ingredients that aren't being regulated in any way, shape or form. So they you know, they're they're. They're adding neutral grain spirit to, you know, to thin out a whiskey to make more, you know, quantity over quality. And so I think historically, American blended whiskeys had a bad reputation and it took years to come out of that reputation. And, and really 
our goal was to kind of embrace the way the Scots have done it. You know, they have a master blender. It really takes a craft and an artistry to to take a, a delicate scotch from from one distillery and a more robust scotch from another distillery and find that balance of the blend to to really uphold that. And that was something that that Dave set out to to really embrace is to take retake that ownership of American blends and and own it as a as a good thing, as not only just a good thing, but a high quality aspect. You're taking whiskeys that are that are already fantastic. And you you create them, you, you're subtly putting them together and layering them until you have something that is phenomenal. And it, and generally that's going to be, you know, on that master blenders, uh, you know, that it's basing it on their palate. What do they like? What do they enjoy? And then you layer that in just like a, a you know, a wonderful layer cake. Um, um, really quick, Rob, before we dive into the actual blend, which I'm excited to do. Yes. Um, the one thing that I, when I was going through and doing the research, it was just, interesting and fascinating to me that like kind of the average blend is about eight to ten years old yes. and it tastes like that and to me that like that eight to fifteen year window is like my personal sweet spot for whiskeys like i find like they just mellow off a little bit but they still have that fire and intensity of the youth that seems really old and super high quality for just a blend is that kind of an exception and it might I mean, eight to 10 is like, wow. I mean, like I hear people making a big deal about bonded and bond being four years old, but this seems like, excessive and delicious. I, I, I would agree. So eight years, I think is kind of a sweet spot. Um, you know, and honestly, and, and, and I, I would, I would also agree with you on the, uh, you know, kind of heading towards that 15 year uh, on some whiskeys that, that really helps a whiskey. Um, there's also a point where you can over oak a whiskey. You can let it ride too long. And then it's it's like chewing on a tree branch, you know, just just gnawing on wood, and and you lose all the elements of the subtleties of the actual whiskey, and, and you know, and, and it, um, it, you know, it's almost like um, you know putting hot sauce on a on a on 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 a meal, and all you can taste is hot sauce, you know. It's um, so you can over oak. So finding that sweet spot in there, um, you know, there's there's blending, there's barrel aging, there's cask finishing. We're adding all these elements that that are really complex that end up with a, a you know, a final project, a product. And that's, um, for me, that's exciting. That's like one of the best three-dimensional puzzles <laughs> out there is just to be able to, to really put together the whiskey and to, uh, and to, and to, to own it, you know, to just to really, um, and again, I think that's, I think everyone has the, the capability of blending. It's just, you know, just like anything, application and application. If you, if you're always doing something to train yourself and to, you know, um, to better your skill set, uh, just like being a, a wine sommelier uh, and, and a spirits um, uh, director, you're always tasting, you're always uh, learning, you're educating yourself. And I think people at home, uh, they could take, if they've got more than three whiskeys uh, on the shelf, they can, they can, they can play around with themselves. You know, they can take a little bit here and a little bit there and, and really under, um, you know, and I, I encourage people to do that because that's that's it's fun. It's exploration uh, of the palate. Well, yeah, Keith, I think you make a, a, a really terrific point on the on the blends and especially the age, because that very much impressed me as well. I am uh, relatively confident. I know quite a few American uh, blended whiskeys out there, and I think they lean a lot more towards four years of aging uh, and then get into a bottle and get onto a shelf and sold to companies like ours. So it's terrific to hear that extra amount of time smooths out the whiskey in a much better, higher quality product. And, and Keith, you know as well, as anyone being a, a master sommelier, you're only as good as the fruit coming in the back door when you're making wine. And, and no matter how good you are of a blender of wine or necessarily whiskey, the, the, the raw ingredients have to be outstanding. So by you guys using an average age of eight years of, of, of aging on the, on the whiskey itself, that shows a lot uh, and, and should really resonate with the consumer. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's really um, going for that, that high quality, um, you know, not breaking the pocketbook, but but embracing the quality of the whiskey, uh, I think is first and foremost, you know, this was, um, you know, before Dave t passed away, this was, um, he was quoted as saying, this is going to be my legacy whiskey. And, uh, and, he, and he really, uh, he put his, his heart and soul into 
uh, you know, all these great relationships that he's had with all these distilleries all over the country and, you know, got to really hand select these whiskeys. Like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going for. I'm going to go talk to these guys. I'm going to buy these barrels. I'm going to talk to these guys, buy these barrels um, because he already had in mind what he wanted to, to put together. And I think it really, you know, the collaboration between Dave and the band um, really kind of grew the whiskey into a place that I don't think anyone really could have anticipated. Um, you know, you, you, utilizing the, the best whiskeys to create the blend first and foremost, then that those subtleties of the cask finishing, you know, the, the black brandy, those elements that really tie the, the spiciness of the rye, the sweetness of the corn, the bourbon together. Um, but then going beyond that uh, into the black noise, the sonic enhancement aspect, um, which to me is just a, a mind blowing, I'm, I'm a whiskey nerd. So I, I love to <laughs> pick apart how to make the whiskey and when I first really looked into uh, the sonic enhancement process, I I really uh, was blown away by that. We can get into that after we after we do a little blending. Yeah, well, let's blend. And I'm super curious. Like, should I use the rye as my base, or should I use one of the bourbons? Like, you well, guys usually start with the corn or start with the rye. That, no, that's a and that's a great uh, it's a great question. So ideally, what I like to do, and this is this is something that I would encourage you to do. You know, these are numbered just so we can uh, we can <clears throat> so we can see which one's which. Uh, but that's really not really important. Um, what I would do is actually go through and just um, nose nose each whiskey, and I've got a couple of Glen Cairns here. You can put just a little dash into a Glen Cairn um, and nose which whiskey that you want to start with. So I think, you know, ultimately uh, being able to say, oh, you know what, I, I want to lean towards a sweeter, I want to lean towards a sweeter whiskey to, you know, to start with. So you might, you might start with a, a Kentucky bourbon or the Tennessee bourbon. Um, so let's see, that was. Yeah, it's always fascinating to me how much rye actually smells like rye. I know that's like a total duh, but. Yeah, how much, like, how much like, rice where, where's the pastrami? Where's the mustard? Right. <laughs> uh, and this is, you know, this is the exciting part. So, you know, take a take a moment to uh, pick up each glass, nose it, you know, keep your, make sure you keep your, obviously your your samples, uh, so you know which one's which, um, and nose it, and from that point, kind of get an idea. Of, oh, I want to. Where do you want to start from? Boy, I just love the Indiana rye. It yes, that it, it just it just calls my name. It's Beautiful. so earthy. I mean, there's there's something about it that makes you you know feel like you're getting a hug from from the earth or something. It's just uh... yeah. But I feel like I, as much as I love the high notes, I feel like that we need some low. We need some bass. Yes. And to me, that's you know I, I'm thinking like all right, the Tennessee definitely feels the heaviest and grounded. So I'm thinking maybe a little bit of that as my bass and kind of fill out the mid palette, you know, add my lead guitar with the uh, Kentucky. <laughs> you know, honestly, that was, uh, I was, I was leaning in the same direction, Keith, that I, you know, Tennessee, I think starting with the Tennessee bourbon gives us a solid bass. Now these are graduated um, uh, eyedroppers. So this is one milliliter, uh, one milliliter eyedropper. So you've got uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.50, 0 0.75, and then one. Uh, so you can really start out if you're going to use it as the base, maybe um, start with 50 mLs to kind of give it a little okay. bit of base, and then we can we can work from there. And you can always add more, of course. While we're putting together our little uh, blends here, talk to us in, uh, uh, a little bit about Indiana and why it's so important and, and, and why it needs to be m more recognized maybe than it is right now. I, you know, that's a great, uh, that's a great question, Scott. I, you know, Indiana is corn country. You know, you're, you're taking, uh, you're taking the, the best elements of Indiana. You're, you're also, it's, uh, it's always about your water source as well. Um, you know, some of the largest distilleries in Indiana have a, a great aquifer, so they already have access to great water, access to great corn, and uh, and you know, hundreds of years of of knowledge of of you know being experts in their field. And Indiana, I think, is has been looking to get the, the same recognition that Kentucky or Tennessee whiskeys 
uh, you know, they have those designations that, um, you know, they want it, they want it to be known. This is from Kentucky. This is from Tennessee and Indiana makes such great whiskey. Um, they really deserve that, that, that designation too, as well. Yeah. I kind of feel like personally, it's a lot of the best rise I've had out of the U S or coming out of Indiana. Uh, I agree. I agree. And, and, and obviously there's a lot of, uh, they, they make, they make great whiskey and they, and they need to be renowned for that. You know, that's, uh, there's so many whiskeys out there that have been utilizing um, Indiana rise, Indiana bourbons. Um, I think it's important that they get the recognition that they deserve. Um, so having uh, real quick, just going back to the blending. So I started, I actually, you know, this is, again, this is your, your preference. Um, uh, that's kind of the, the, the fun part about this. Is it's, it's your own chemistry set, so to speak of, of whiskey. So I, you know, I actually started out with, uh, with one full milliliter of, of the Tennessee bourbon. And then, um, as you're, as you're going along, um, you know, take a nose on your, on your, uh, Indiana rye, a uh, nose on the Kentucky bourbon, figure out which elements you want. Do you want this to be uh, more rye forward? Do you want it to be more bourbon forward? Um, you know, and just have the, the rye as a, uh, a, a supporting act, or do you want it to be, uh, the front man, just like you're, uh, using your analogy, Keith. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I I think I'm kind of at the happy spot where I almost want like the Vesper recipe with my tendency being the gin, larger component than my, he is like my vodka and then using the rye as like the lelay, you know, lighter kind of pretty lifted on the finish. Yes, yeah. And see, it's fun. You're, um, and, and you're, you're probably, you know, you're utilizing, uh, your aspects of understanding wine and wine blends and how, how that works. And I think, um, and again, this is, you know, just trusting your own palate, uh, really identifying what, what's, uh, what works. Yeah. It's funny you say that. So would it be, you know, would like, it be fair to say with the three okay. ingredients that we have, uh, here that, that, that we could come very close to, to, replicating what I have here is batch number 112. And so if I said that, you know, I used um, uh, 75 uh, uh, base uh, on one of the items and then 50 and 50 on the other two, at some point you realize, hey, it's it's getting very, very close to the base, to the, to the original or the finished product. It, it could get it's very close. Um, we are, we're only using three elements of, of the whiskey. Um, we have, we have more elements to our whiskey that, uh, that we didn't, we didn't add to this. Um, and, uh, so you could certainly start heading in the direction. Obviously the other thing that we're missing is the, uh, the, the black brandy cask finish. So, you know, if we had an, an aspect of the black brandy where we could, we could drop that in, um, we would probably be getting even closer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as far as sonic enhancement, we could probably take our cell phones out and, you know, put on some Metallica and, and blast <laughs> our, our little sample as, as, uh, as loud as we can. Um, now you're talking. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, but, you know, we, we certainly could get, uh, head towards a, um, a direction, but, um, obviously we don't have all the components here that we, we would have, um, uh, in, in the well, final, final product. Well, and Rob, you've mentioned it a couple of times and maybe it's time now to dive into it. Cause I feel like the blend without the sonic enhancements, kind of like Metallica Unplugged, which still rocks and is amazing. But I feel like it's time to like plug in the subwoofers, the amps, and wh what is the sonic enhancement, black noise, black music, you know, what is this whole thing? Because it definitely adds another element that as much as I like the blend I've come up with, I'm sure Scott, you like yours too. It's like, it still doesn't have that extra oomph. You know, what's, what's the sonic enhancement all about? That is, um, you know, this is this is where the uh, the tour bus the tour bus takes a a, a detour in a, in a way. So, <laughs> we we um, you know, this was really exciting. I I've you know when I was a master distiller here in Colorado, I had, I'd been looking at acoustic. Um, uh, well, I was I was not acoustic, but I was looking at cavitation, the movements of, of pipes and 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 creating uh, energy, and um, and Dave came up with this great idea. And this was an inspiration that he had from his time as a cadet at West Point. And he had uh, befriended the caretaker for the pipe organ in the cathedral there, one of the largest pipe organs in North America. And uh, the, the gentleman had shown him a note on the, on the pipe organ that he 
would not, he was afraid to sustain for very long for fear <laughs> of bringing the building down on top of them because it would start to vibrate the building aggressively. Um, and he was- So, he, so that was the cool. Spinal Tap 11. Yes, exactly. We're taking this to 11. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so, you know, that's exactly what, uh, you know, that always stuck with Dave that, you know, there, there could be a possibility of utilizing sound uh, in the in the barrel uh, finishing process or the whiskey making process. And of course, what better you know way to do that? You have uh, the power in the wall of sound of Metallica uh, at your disposal. So he, uh, he, he, he came up with this idea and, and brought it to the band. Of course, they loved it. I mean, this is this is the way to keep their fingerprints on the whiskey. This is a real collaboration. These these guys are, are masters of sound and you know, Dave is masters of whiskey. We're, we're tying all these elements in and literally making whiskey with music. Not only traditional methods of our grain and our rye and our, our corn, uh, barrel aging, you know, eight years in white American oak, then cask finishing uh, in black brandy. Now we're applying the, 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 the power of Metallica uh, to the entire process. And I think what's uh what's important to note is that we're we're doing this during the cask finishing process so two 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 things are happening at the same time we're cask finishing uh the the, the black brandy uh the whiskey in black brandy um and we are applying the black noise process and how we do that is we have a proprietary device that was created by uh, a sound the sound company that creates uh, metallica's proprietary equipment for their touring uh, show for their their studio uh, equipment. This is all prote- proprietary equipment by one of the best uh, companies on the planet. So again, another master of their craft. So we brought all these all these masters into the same place and created this uh, proprietary device that we play, of course, Metallica music um, at a very low frequency. So uh, you know anywhere the lowest you know being four four hertz and and above. Um, it's so low that you you can't really hear it with the human ear. It's it's a more of a muffled vibrating hum. Um, and, but what that does, played at that frequency, creates an active vibration where uh, you're moving the whiskey in and out of the wood at a very rapid pace. I actually have a um, this this really helps for a lot of folks. Uh, I've got a visual here. Um, so this is a this is a, a whiskey barrel stave. This is a uh, a barrel stave, a used barrel. This was a, num- uh, a white oak with a number three char. All this right here is, uh, is a deep char, which is also called an alligator char. Uh, if you can see right there, you can see the, the whiskey line. Um, so that is how far the whiskey moved in and out of the barrel. Now, during normal barrel aging, it's about temperature. Uh, the cold nights push the whiskey out of the wood back into the barrel. The warm, the warm days pull the whiskey back into the wood. So as it's doing that, um, after you've, you've charred this wood, all the natural sugars, all the vanillins, those, those, those great flavors of the wood uh, create a caramelized band of sugar right here. All that whiskey is moving in and out of the wood, picking up all of those flavors and those elements. When we apply the black noise sonic enhancement process, we're going past that red line, that whiskey line there, and it's moving in and out at a very rapid pace. Uh, so you're you're getting a lot more interaction with the wood in a very short period of time. You know, we're not we're not trying to, uh, um, you know, change or or speed up the the aging process. We are making an enhancement to an already aged whiskey. So it's really important to note that that the whiskey that we already have uh, already has that depth and those elements. But now we're going we're going beyond, and the uh, of course I wanted to see the science behind it, uh, behind it, <laughs> just like anything, uh, uh, you know that that if if you're creating a good whiskey, you need a control. Just like we started uh, this program with a controlled whiskey, we now have uh, uh, we had a barrel that we were cask finishing and did not apply the black noise process to, and then we had a second barrel that we were cask finishing and applied the black noise sonic enhancement process to. We took both those samples, we sent them off to the lab. And uh, when you are, uh, according to uh, the independent state company who puts out a, a barrel book every year, you're looking for nine different flavor profile markers from the wood, from the barrel. Um, and every single one of those profile markers in the sonic enhanced barrel were completely elevated over our control barrel that had not had the black noise applied to it. So right there, we had our, our scientific proof and we also, uh, this is cutting edge. This is this is the pioneering into the great beyond. Besides, 
you know, what Kentucky was doing with whiskey. Now we're going into uh, you know, new technology. We're applying this great innovation to an already traditional uh, way of making whiskey. And it's pretty exciting. No, it's very so, exciting, and you know, it it it's it's exciting. It, but but there's a lot of logic involved in this. Uh, uh, it it almost surprises me that somebody hadn't figured this out before. But but uh, it, glad it was you guys, and obviously glad it was Metallica. Uh, of course, you know, and certainly we are we're not the first uh, to play music to the barrels. But I really feel like we were the first to actually apply uh, the science behind it. One question or a couple questions. I'm like. It, it, it fascinates me, and I love like going on the website and being able to see like the playlist that goes with each batch. Um, how significant is the playlist? Like, did you find like, you know, like oh, Kurt's playlist are way better, and the you know the whiskey ends up tasting far better, you know, or you know, does James is better? I mean, you know, is the stuff with the symphony add a little extra element? I mean, in the sound wave, you have peaks and valleys. You got all these peaks and valleys in here. Um, that's movement. That's 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 motion that's that's movement of sound so if you think about uh, uh you, you put two different songs side by side you're going to see the different playlists you're going to see one might have a shorter uh more staccato um peaks and valleys whereas you've got these longer uh, and 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 metallica is such a bass forward band uh, they're, they're really a based their their sound off of that and so um you, you know you're going to find that each playlist is going to be a little bit different if you're picking some of the ballads uh, and, and to really kind of back up just a, a, a point there. Um, so Keith, you know, to your, to your point, you know, we've got, I've got batch 105 here. Um, the way this works, the band uh, members take turns selecting the playlist that's played to every batch. So every batch that has a different playlist selected by a band member, someone might, uh, you know, pick more ballads. Uh, you know, Kirk might pick more guitar solo, uh, more <laughs> ballad-esque tunes where Robert Trujillo is going to go for those bass forwards. He wants to hear that bass solo. Um, those, those, are, those are elements that are always going to have these subtle changes to, um, to the whiskey. And, and that is the, the beauty of, of being able to go on to blackandwhiskey.com, look up your batch number 105. You see which band member selected the playlist. Uh, there's a Spotify icon right there. You can take a photo of that. That will populate that playlist into your Spotify, and you can actually listen to the playlist selected by the band member that was actually used for enhancing the whiskey. Uh, so a full, a full uh, uh, interactive experience for the consumer, as well as um, uh, the whiskey. I think uh, you know understanding new elements where whiskey's going, and also the Metallica fan. I think it really embraces everyone, embraces uh, whiskey enthusiasts uh, and Metallica fans alike. Because uh, it's it's just a fun process. Very cool. And speaking of so, fun, I know we've got one more thing to taste, and uh, that is actually some cask strength, and I believe it's limited edition too. So the cask strength, you can, uh, it, it's you know we're adults, we get to drink the whiskey the way we want to. So you can <laughs> add just a little bit of um, you know filtered water. I've got I've got my filtered water here with a with an eyedropper. Um, add a couple drops, let that whiskey open up and bloom. Um, and I really feel like um, having a cask strength gives us that freedom to, to drink the whiskey the way we want to. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to join you gentlemen with, uh, the, you got the cask strength, this, uh, the, the, the difference there, you can see that label there on the bottom, um, that, uh, that shows that this was a cask strength. It has the, the, the proof working with uh, a cask strength, let it acclimate your mouth. Um, uh, and it's just always such a pleasant experience uh, to, to be able to like, <laughs> roll over that first taste and start to just identify what is that I, i'm you know seeing all these little nuances wow yeah what do you what do you think yeah, scott yeah, some beautiful. There's some. There's some a, a gorgeous caramel uh, layer to it. Maybe a little toastiness on the top of that. And uh, uh, one thing that jumped out really quick is is and and like you said about just reminding you of your past is just it jumped out a little bag of butterscotch drops uh, or in there without a doubt. Uh, they, they they just jumped right out and it and it it brought me back to my childhood. Yeah, very very nice. Absolutely, I, and that's a great one. You know, like you'll get. Um, you know, like those butterscotch, which I get as well. And that's also partly, I think, the mouthfeel, you know, at a higher proof, you're not chill filtering, you're, you've got a, a great mouthfeel. It's it's like a buttery butterscotch, um, you know, finish. And, uh, um, and I, you know, I think you're, you know, some of the vanilla elements you're going to get, those are actual vanillins from the wood that, that are, that are being brought in, um, you know, a lot different than the, than the wine industry where a light toast will, will, 
you know, bring those nuances to a wine, uh, you know, historically in, in American whiskey, that deep char is, is where you're going to get all that flavor from that, that band of caramel. So we, we want more of those woody aspects for a whiskey, whereas you don't always necessarily want those wood aspects for, uh, for a wine. That's more of like a, a new style of wine as, as opposed to like a classic. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of that, just I, I, to me, I mean, maybe I'm just a lush, but there's like the cast strength that's just like, oh, you know, it, I get the sweetness without as much sweetness, not to say that any of these are sweet at all, but I just love that. It's just like, it's all in, like I am American whiskey. And I think back to like some of like in the scotch industry, when we first started to see some of the brandy finished cask, you know, the sherry finished, what, you know, whatever was trendy at the moment. And I always thought it was a little bit of an odd mix because you had like the sweetness of the brandy with like a little bit of the scotch funk. And it yes. was almost kind of like someone like spraying an aroma over something to kind of cover it up. And it was just this weird marriage. Whereas I feel like the American whiskey, whether it's the sweetness from the corn or the American oak, then with the brandy, it's just, it's like doubling down on something that's good and making it even better. Rob, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, I look forward to enjoying many of your whiskeys um, now and in future years. Um, Scott, do you have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I just I just love the process. I love the entire interview uh, uh, there. It's terrific to have you on. Uh, it's it, it makes it a lot easier for us when you have somebody as passionate as you and detailed and, and, and understand from a historical uh, perspective and, 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 and also looking to the future. So uh, terrific product. Uh, I look forward to adding this uh, to a bunch of our restaurant portfolios. That's fantastic. And gentlemen, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, you know, we could we could wax poetic for for hours around like, the history of whiskey and the elements of whiskey, and um, I look forward to uh, being able to to share a dram or, or two uh, with you in person someday. So I really enjoyed being on here, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Sounds like a good plan. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you, gents. Cheers. Cheers. Blackened!